In Alice in Wonderland, when Alice goes down the rabbit hole, that's the underworld, right? So now she's gone into the substructure of being. And she meets the Red Queen. And the Red Queen is Mother Nature. And Mother Nature is running around yelling, off with her heads, off with her heads, which is, of course, what Mother Nature does. And she tells Alice, in my kingdom, you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place. And that's exactly right. And that's a description of, in fact, evolutionary biologists, psychologists have picked up on that phrase. They call it the Red Queen problem. And the Red Queen problem is everything's after you all the time and you're not smart enough to do anything about it or enough about it. And so that's a permanent existential problem. So how do you deal with that? You've got a biological structure. So your embodiment is part of the solution to the problem. And then you're enculturated. And because you're enculturated, you're taught a lot of things that you need to know. But mostly what you're taught is how to communicate with other people in an acceptable manner. And then once you can communicate with people in an acceptable manner, then you can outsource your problems constantly, which you're doing constantly. And so we're in this continual dynamic exchange of problem solving. So if you're a socialized person, that's what you get access to. And that's something to know if you're going to have kids. And I mentioned this, I think, in a previous lecture. The, pur the purpose of being a parent for very young children is to make your children exceptionally socially desirable by the age of four. Because if you can do that, they're set. Because everyone wants them around. And as soon as everybody wants them around, they want to play with them, they want to cooperate with them, they want to compete with them. It's like the door's open, the door's open, and they stay sane because they've got all sorts of people who actually like them that are helping them out. And so that's your goal, is to make them as socially acceptable as you possibly can, as socially desirable as you possibly can. And that doesn't mean you render them obedient without spirit, right? That's, that's a tyrant's mode of... of enforcing social acceptability. It's like, never do anything wrong. Well, that's not any way to, I mean, that's a good piece of advice, you know, like, but it's missing the other half, which is do a bunch of things that are right so that, so that people are thrilled to have you around and, to, and encourage that. That's what you want to do as a parent, as well as inculcating the order. And so, you know, and in this little diagram, I indicated that so there's God the Father with the Son behind him, and he's ruling over this walled city. So he's like the meta spirit of the walled city. It's a very, very nice, very nice image, brilliant image. So it's, it's, it's the collective spirit of the city. That's another way of thinking about it, or the collective spirit of the city across time, or the collective spirit of the force that built and maintained the city across time. Even better. And that's associated with the sun because it's, a, it's, it's, it's associated with enlightenment and illumination and all of those things that we associate with higher consciousness and vision. It's a brilliant image. And then I overlaid this, you know. Now, of course, the, the patriarchal aspect of existence can become tyrannical. It does that quite regularly. It's one of the existential dangers of human civilization is that civilization is a medication for chaos but it can spin out of control in and of itself and become its own sort of problem, which is like a hyper-order problem generally, which then pr produces a chaos problem. So every solution carries within it certain problems, right? Because no solution is perfect, and so you have to keep things in balance. But it's one of the reasons that I'm really, uh, let's call it irritated, about the postmodernists, because they keep yammering about the patriarchy. And it's very, very annoying because, because it's self-evident that social structures are tyrannical. It's like, that's not news, folks. That's obvious. But that's not all they are. And it's, it's, the, it's the reduction of the entire complex solution, let's say, to a unidimensional problem. It's just ty tyranny. It's like, no, actually, it's not just tyranny. If you spent six months somewhere that was just tyranny, you'd know the difference very, very rapidly. And that doesn't mean that everyone doesn't give up a pound or two or 10 or 20 of flesh to participate even in a society that's as free as a Western society is. We all get crushed and molded by the tyrannical force of social convention. But at least in principle, the benefit is worth the cost. And then it's also up to you to make sure that you don't sacrifice more to the group than you should. 
And you can start to tell if you're sacrificing more to the group than you should because you start to become resentful of other people. That's part of the, that's part of the psychological mechanism that's informing you of that. So it's up to you to fight against the, you know, the overarching pressure for conformity to retain your individual logos, let's say. But that's sort of your problem. It's like the group wants you to behave. Now, if you could behave and be creatively productive, so much the better, but that's pretty damn rare. So the group generally tends to settle just for behave, and there's a tyrannical element of that, but what the hell's the alternative? It's, you know, our society is based on consensus, and the consensus is based on the sacrifice of, in, a certain sacrifice of individuality, even though individuality is absolutely necessary as a revitalizing force for the society. It's a very touch, tough thing to manage properly. So anyways, you have the, your physiological structure as your first line of ordering in relationship to chaos, because your body presents you with the world in a certain way. And then the second line of defense is something like the sociological structure that you inhabit. We could call those the competency hierarchies or something like that. And thank God for them, because, you know, Maybe you're going to be able to specialize in one or two things in your life, or five things, but there's 300 things you need to know. And if it's just you, you know, you'll be doing your genius level mathematics while your bathtub is leaking all over your, all over your bathroom floor. And that's not so good, so you can call a plumber and hooray for that. So, you know, we tend to cooperate to keep chaos under control. And we tend to cooperate to keep order under control. And that's the political dialogue, right? We maintain the culture to keep chaos under control, and we balance the culture out properly to keep the culture under control. And that way we get to live reasonably peacefully, reasonably productively, for a reasonable amount of time. And that's the best that we can do. And we should have some gratitude when that's working, because the default condition of things is that not only do they not work very well, they work worse and worse over time all by themselves. So anytime anything is working, you should just be amazed by it. <laughs> all right, so what does the frame look like? Well, I think it looks something like this. And this is, as far as I can tell, this is the bare bones. This is the bare bones of a variety of things. It's a bare bones story. It's a bare bones conceptual framework. It's a bare bones design to, to speak in. Heideggerian terms, it's like it's the bare bones world that you live in. You're always in one of these worlds. There's no getting out of them. You can move from one to another, but you're always in a world like this. And so this is the world that you're in. You're somewhere, because you have to be somewhere. Now, you might not know where that is, which means that the somewhere that you are is chaotic, in which case you need to go over your past in great detail and figure out where you are. It's like you're lost, right? You're you're lost, and the problem with being lost is when you're lost, you don't know where to go, and the problem with not knowing where to go is there's a million places that you could go, and a million places is too many places for you to go without dying. So being lost is not good. So you need to know where you are. One of the things that we built online, my partners and I, is this program called Past Authoring that helps people lay out the, the, the narrative of their past to identify to break their life down into six stages, epochs we call them, and then to identify the emotionally significant moments in each epoch and to write them out, what happened negatively, what happened positively, what the consequences were, what you derived from it, perhaps what you could have done differently, perhaps what you learned from it, all of that, so that you can narrow in, zero in, on determining precisely where it is that you are right now. And people are often loath to do that because they actually don't want to know, because they'd rather be spread out in a sort of half-blind manner in the fog, hoping that the place that they're at is better than it really is, and deluding themselves by remaining vague, than to figure out, I'm right here right now with these specific problems. But it's actually better to, to do that. Because if you have a set of specific problems, and you've really narrowed them down and really specified them, then you can probably start fixing them. And you can start fixing them in mic micro ways, bit by bit. But there's no way you can do that without knowing where you are. It's impossible. And you can kind of tell if you don't know where you are. It's quite straightforward. If you are haunted by reveries of the past, for events that are older than approximately 18 months, if they continue to come up in your mind over and over, in your dreams over and over, 
You haven't extracted the world out from your past experiences. The potential is still trapped in the past. And to confront the potential means to confront the dragon of the past. And of course, that's terrifying. And it can seriously be terrifying. So for example, maybe you're vague and ill-formed and ill-defined because you were abused very badly when you were a child, four years old, something like that. And maybe you were abused by a family member because that's generally who does the abusing. And so that just makes it worse. And then what that means is that you've got a implicit, you've had an implicit encounter with malevolent evil that, no, you've had a direct encounter with malevolent evil, but you have an implicit hypothesis of malevolent evil that's plaguing you. It's still there. It's trapped in the memories, right? It's, it's trapped in the representational structure. And as an adult, you're now faced with the necessity of articulating that fully before you have any chance whatsoever of freeing yourself from it. And so that's no joke. Lots of times people have to go into the past. That's what the psychoanalysts do and, th and say, look, here is something came along and just bloody well knocked me over. And it isn't even that I repressed it, which, which I think was, well, we won't talk about Freud's errors because Freud was a genius, so we'll just leave him alone. But, but sometimes it's not repression. It's just the terrible things happen to people at such a young age that there isn't a bloody chance in hell that they can figure out why they happened or what to do with them or what they mean. And then you can carry that with you and you carry it with you. It's like you're... you're your body encounters the world in stages, and it happens very rapidly. Well, it can extend over years, but the initial stages happen very rapidly. So, for example, if you're walking down the road and you hear a large noise, be a loud noise behind you, you'll go like this. That's a predator defense response, by the way. You crouch down, and that's to stop something from jumping on your back and getting at your neck too easily. That's like a few, mil a few hundred milliseconds. It's really fast, or even faster than that, and it better be because... Something like a snake, we'll say, can nail you just right now, so you better be fast. But it's low resolution. It's like danger snake, something like that, or danger predatory cat. It's that fast. And then you can unravel that and categorize it, but that takes time. You do that with emotion, and then you do it with cognition, and you can do that with long-term thinking, you know, because maybe you've encountered someone specifically malevolent and predatory at work. That happens to people a lot, who's operating as a as a destructive bully and who seems to have no positive function whatsoever and is only living that out. And then you, you, know, you don't know what to do about it. So you're, you're in prey mode. I don't mean this kind of mode, although that would help too. But I mean, you're acting like a prey animal and then you have this terribly complex thing to decompose, which is what the hell's up with this person? Why are they making my life miserable? What is it about me that allows them to make my life miserable? That's a nasty little road to walk down. And you're stuck with having to, you're stuck with having to decompose it. Maybe you can't. Maybe formulating an explicit philosophy of good and evil to deal with something malevolent in your environment actually just happens to be beyond you. And that could easily be. It's certainly the case for people who are young. And it's the case for plenty of adults as well. It's no simple thing to, man to manage. It's something, too, that often soldiers who have post-traumatic stress disorder have to do because they've encountered terrible things. They've either done them or ran into them. and They need to update their moral model of the world or they end up in something close enough, closely approximating hell. <laughs>